and good evening and welcome to Red Card. I'm your host, Anthony Toterra, and once again, we welcome you worldwide, and we thank you so much for making this your destination, your spot to listen to national, international, local, you name it, we discuss it all here, and tonight, MLS Playoffs is right on top of mind of many all across Canada and the U.S. of A. We'll discuss it for the first part of the show with two of the best and two of the young guys on the rise in this business. From the score, Armin Bedekian will join us in a minute or less. Joshua Cloak of The Athletic. We will discuss TFC, who their possible opponent will be, and we'll also get their thoughts on who will be the Eastern and Western finalists and who will win it all. We'll do it with them in just a moment with Armin and then Joshua a little bit later on in the first part of the show. The second part of the show, I want to get some things off my chest when it comes to grassroots uh, soccer all across this country. I've got a number of notes here, a number of notes, a number of uh, little things that I want to discuss and I want to get your thoughts out there after I've discussed it and I'd like to hear your feedback after uh, I've said all I've had to say. We're going to go in a lot of different areas. We'll go talk uh, about, obviously, the financial part of the game. We'll talk about so-called elite leagues. Uh, we'll, talk about, we'll talk about everything, and then I'll get your thoughts. But right now, joining us from The Score, a guy that is no stranger to the show, and he's getting ready for the MLS playoffs. They've already begun. Right now is Armin Bedekian of The Score. Armin, welcome, my friend. Thanks for having me, Anthony. Hey, pleasure's all mine. I'm getting ready uh, to watch the Whitecaps in San Jose tonight. That should be a cracker of a game. Uh, I, I believe that the Whitecaps will go the distance. I tweeted it out. I think it'll be Don Garber's worst nightmare. The commissioner of MLS, the TFC, will meet Vancouver Whitecaps in the final. So let's get right to it, Armin. Let's break down who the possible opponent in your mind uh, will be for TFC, and then we'll look at the pros, the cons, the pluses, and the minuses on that opponent. Your thoughts. Okay, so uh, if Chicago wins tonight, it can't be Chicago. So there's one of the four teams that we don't need to worry about until at least the, the conference final. Um, so it really just leaves Atlanta, Columbus, and the New York Red Bulls. I would love the New York Red Bulls. They're historically not a very strong playoff team, and it's a team that we've beaten. Um, it's a team that has a lot of weaknesses that can be exploited, but it's also a team that's going to put up a pretty decent fight, I think. Um, in, in general, I think I'd prefer the Red Bulls because I feel like over two legs, Toronto FC can outscore them, and that's sort of the big, um, the big advantage I see. I really hope it's not one of Columbus or Atlanta. That, to me, presents a problem. Uh, Atlanta is one of those teams where I just have this never-ending fear that we'll go down to Mercedes-Benz Stadium and and lose four or five nothing, and then even if we come home, it'll and win, it'll be like a three nothing win, and it's just this disaster sort of fantasy that I've have I'm, I've been having for much of the last half of the season, to be honest. And then Columbus, I wasn't really worried about Columbus so much, and then in the last few weeks, uh, all this talk of of moving the team to Austin, Texas. That has to have the players really motivated to show up. I mean, when you don't know what your future looks like, I mean, it's very easy to give up, but it also puts that chip on your shoulder. So I'm really hoping to avoid either of those two teams until at least the uh, at least the conference final, and I'm hoping that Toronto gets uh, New York Red Bulls out Good. of this next round. Good points. Now, let's discuss that. I, I actually am going to go completely opposite. I I'm, I'm quite concerned if they play the Red Bulls. The last game here in Toronto, uh, with a lot of their starters out, they played TFC physical. They played them toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Uh, offensively, defensively, I thought that they uh, were a complete uh, organized team and they could be really, really dangerous. I would love to see, I, I got to tell you, I'd love to see them play Atlanta right off the hop. TFC has an unbelievable lineup. Let's go. Let's get it going. Play the one that you fear the most, which is Atlanta. We know that right out of the get-go. Get them done with if you if if you believe that uh, destiny is in your hand this year, and then hey, go on to the next challenge. Whether it's the Red Bulls, Columbus, Chicago, whoever, get it going. Uh, New York City FC could be in that mix, but I'm not as afraid as Atlanta as everyone is. Yes, they've got some great talent there, but I think with the veterans of TFC, the playoff is a different animal. I think they present something uh, in the season that they will not present in the playoffs, Armin. Yeah, absolutely. And the the one fact that I will say about Atlanta is, even though Toronto, uh, even though Atlanta has been very good, Toronto's pretty much stepped toe to toe with them, if not bested them. So, 
I'm not too afraid of Atlanta in terms of our uh, in terms of Toronto's ability to handle them. I think it's just that whole momentum going into it. I mean, Toronto sort of backed into the playoffs in the last couple of days. Like uh, the mind was on the supporter shield, the record, and I know the players will say that they were focused, but the last two three results weren't exactly like hot form. Whereas Atlanta is coming in really really hot. Um, I I personally don't want to deal with the whole Atlanta storyline. That's my motivation for hoping that it's not them. I'd rather it would just be New York City FC's problem, you know? And then if we meet New York City FC, then that's great. We know how to play them. We know how to beat them. Um, And if we meet Atlanta, then then that's that's a different story for a different day. But uh, the one, I think, variable with the Red Bulls that I sort of, like I would sort of prefer them right off the bat is just because they're not particularly, uh, like, front heavy they're not particularly defensively weak they're just a, a, a normal opponent and they're coming in with normal form and it's just over two legs i feel as though toronto can beat them over two legs without too much of an effort the other ones are, are more tricky the other ones have these very very clear advantages and while sasha question and bradley red phillips are a very dynamic duo i just see more chance for toronto to sort of find their feet in the playoffs again because it's a whole other animal and that's sort of the factor that I'm, I'm considering with them. Let's talk about now, whoever the opponent might be, what are your concerns for TFC going into this playoffs? Uh, I'll tell you what my concerns are, then I'd like to hear about your concerns. Obviously, we know what their upside is. They've got a deep, deep bench. I think the deepest bench of anyone in the league, that's a positive. We know that they can score uh, goals uh, by the handful with Josie and Seba. Uh, and we know that Michael Bradley stirs the drink. But I'm concerned, I'm going to be very honest, Armin, I'm concerned of the back line. I said this about a month ago, sitting right next to uh, a colleague in the press box, and I said, I'm concerned of the back line, and I'm also a bit concerned of Alex Bono. He's going into his first playoff game, Armin. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Alex Bono has uh, doesn't have the playoff experience, but I also have seen in Alex Bono the sort of qualities that I haven't seen in a Toronto FC goalkeeper since Stefan Fry, which is a tremendous amount of reliability, and he's also got that goalkeeper's luck. That's a factor that so few goalkeepers really have, and whether that's going to hold or it's going to run out, we don't know yet, but Alex Bono, in the, especially in the last three weeks, has been an incredibly fortunate goalkeeper. Some of the bounces, I mean, Toronto should have eaten more goals, but uh, I do agree about the back line. Some of it has been a little shaky, and almost concerningly so. Uh, not having Nick Hagland as a as a like a healthy starting option uh, or an inform option, I should say, might pose a bit of a problem. But I also think that it's interesting that Greg Vanny switched to a four man back line in the last game because if you remember last season, I think it was Greg Vanny didn't switch to a three man back line until also very late in the regular season. He just experimented with it and went with it in the playoffs. So maybe that's more of the same. Maybe Greg seeing something about the defensive shape and maybe we we might see Toronto play a four-man backline for some of these playoff games too. Certainly Chris Mavinga has emerged as a tremendous option and Drew Moore is always going to be reliable. Uh, there are options. There, there, as, long as, um, as long as we don't overcomplicate things, I don't think that there should be a reason to really worry. Toronto FC's defense did concede, I think, the second fewest goals in the entire year. So... Uh, as far as that's concerned, I'm not too overly worried about it. But I do agree that there should be some very clear uh, and, and uh, I guess, yeah, clear tactics and clear plans as to what that back line is going to look like. Let's talk about coaching. You mentioned Greg Vanny. I don't see anyone in the Eastern Conference out coaching him. Maybe Patrick Vieira can go toe-to-toe with him. And, and I would actually say that they could probably go toe-to-toe, but no one else. Uh, in the Western Conference, we'll get to that momentarily. I believe Peter Vermees is, for my money anyway, the best coach in MLS, hands down. You? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he took a team that really doesn't have that many huge bright spots besides a couple players, and he made them into a defensive powerhouse. So they conceded the fewest, I think 29 goals out of 34 games. is incredible. It's incredible. So they're one of those teams in the West that I'm really afraid of. I don't think anybody out coaches Greg Vanny in the East, though. And I think it's because Toronto FC isn't just being coached in a way that works in MLS. Toronto FC, in my experience, is one of the very few teams that are actually that have actually transitioned to 3-5-2 soccer or 3-4-3 or whatever you want to call it in the best possible way. I mean, it drives me absolutely crazy to see teams in the Premier League, teams in Serie A or wherever, 
that are now starting to play three-man back lines, but they're slotting in random players out wide in those wing-back positions like, oh, yeah, you're a right wing-back now, you're a left wing-back now. That's not the case of Toronto FC. Uh, the wing-backs on Toronto FC are genuine assets at that position. Justin Morrow scores goals like a striker, and that's the thing. Greg Vanny has a very, I, I don't want to say easy, but a very straightforward job. He's playing three-five-two soccer with all the pieces that work in it, and because of that, his tactical shape, all of it makes sense. He's not forcing anything. That's really the brilliance of it, I think, and that's the reason why I'm really confident with Vanny's approach in the playoffs. Plus, they've been here before. They know what it takes to get to the final. The only difference is what it takes to win a final. So if everything goes as planned, there shouldn't be too, too much of a, of a concern, but that's the playoffs. Nothing really ever goes as planned. Absolutely. Armin, just before we go to the Western Conference, I look back to last year and that magical run that unfortunately didn't end the way all of us wanted here in Toronto. And I think to now, starting the playoffs this year, and the ace in the hole, the real gem that people are going to see, hopefully, if he's injury-free, will be Victor Vasquez. I believe if he is healthy, and I believe if he's ready to rock and roll like he's done since he's gotten here, watch out. You're going to see something like you've never seen before. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if Vasquez was two years younger, yeah, two years younger, that's a designated player right there. There's no way Toronto has him. It's an incredibly lucky set of circumstances, his poor time in Mexico in terms of the lifestyle and stuff, that ultimately drove him to come to Toronto in the first place. So that's the guy that Toronto FC needed to go from a really good team to a great team, and, and they have been. So I think he's absolutely going to be an important figure. But I also think that... Uh, the one thing that MLS teams can't cope with now is the three of them together, Jovinko, Altidore, and, uh, and Vasquez. Before, even the two of them with Jovinko and Altidore were a massive handful, and there were very few teams that could handle it. But now when you've got those two players stretching back lines, and then you've also got Vasquez who not only can pick out the, the best kinds of passes, the kinds of passes that he learned from Barcelona, but he can also score. This is a guy who's shown his ability to score in a lot of different ways. So that triumvirate up top, that's going to be Toronto's key, and those three guys have to stay healthy. Let's talk about the Western Conference. And just before we move on, I mentioned to TFC President Bill Manning, I believe it was today, I, I sent him a message, good luck uh, in the playoffs, uh, hoping to see TFC prevail this time around in the MLS Cup Finals here in Toronto. And I said to me, uh, the two teams that will challenge you will bring it all. Uh, one in the East, as I mentioned, New York Red Bulls, and one in the West, Sporting Kansas City. So let's talk about Sporting Kansas City. I believe they finished off on a poor note. I don't know if you saw that interview with Ike Opara. He ripped into his team with the effort they put in there. I believe it was the last game or the second last game, and he said this isn't good enough. And I believe this is a team that's ready. Uh, they're motivated. They've got a lot of their guys back from disappointment from the USA not qualifying for World Cup. They might have a chip on their shoulder. I believe this could be a team that could beat anyone in the West and get to the final. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, the, like just defensively, like we mentioned before, they're the most steadfast team in the league. But uh, you're right. They didn't have a great end of season. And part of it was getting rid of Dom Dwyer and changing that shape completely. But I also think a part of it is like, Sporting Kansas City is very effect, uh, effective. They're a very efficient team. They're good at getting those 1-0 wins. And over two legs, the ability to hold down and bunker down for a result is invaluable. Like That's one of the key factors that Peter Vermees is going to be relying on. So Ike Parra is right to say that it's not good enough because that requires a full effort. So you, can't have, you can't put in a half-hearted effort on that. So I do definitely agree that Sporting Kansas City is a big threat. I think if they meet the Portland Timbers, that might be the one opponent that can really challenge them because I think the Portland Timbers can be very overwhelming when they're in form. But beyond that, I mean, I don't see Seattle or, or even Vancouver, any of them really challenging uh, Sporting Kansas City too much. Lastly, before we let you go, let's uh, make our, our two pick selections. And before that, who is your MVP of the season, Aaron? My MVP, I know a lot of people aren't going to like this in Toronto. Look, we all love Joe Vinko, but let's be honest. Uh, there was a couple other players this year that I believe had uh, a much, much better uh, season for their clubs. Uh, one uh, is playing out west, and I believe uh, he deserves a lot more respect than we're giving him. Uh, I'll, I'll let you make your pick, but I think you know already who I'm going with in the west. Who's your pick, Armin? I think the conventional pick is someone between Diego Valeri and maybe David Villa again. Yeah. 
Um, I'm going to go in a different direction, mm. and I'm going to say that my MVP of the season is Miguel Almiron. Oh, interesting. I know that's I know that's an unconventional pick, but no player proved more important to their team than Miguel Almiron. And it's not because of how many goals he scored, and it's not because of how many assists he recorded, but it's the fact that Miguel Almiron's presence made a team of complete strangers look like the best ticking uh, yeah. team in MLS more times than any expansion team I've ever seen in my life. Atlanta United is an expansion team. Yeah. These guys have literally never played in this league before. And the fact that they're doing what they're doing and they did it so successfully, I, it's everyone's high on Atlanta United, but it's justified. And to me, Miguel Amiron is the guy who made that story possible. And if he wins an MLS Cup, I mean, it'll be justified 100%. This is a guy who has a future in a big European club one day, and he was, to me, the most valuable player in the league because of the story that he allowed to happen. Yeah, I I'm going to go with uh, Valeri. I, I, I think he's been under the radar uh, since he's arrived here. He's gone about his business the right way. Uh, beautiful player to watch. Uh, he's a guy that I think deserves the respect, like a Jovinko, like a Villa, like an Almeron, and others. So I think it's his time. It would be great to see him get the MVP. One more very quickly, Coach of the Year. I'll give you mine. Look, uh, I'm going to tell you, I'll put the cards on the table. He's a friend, and, and I consider him a friend, and I consider him an outstanding coach. He's broken records, Canadian Championship, Supporter Shield. To me, it's Greg Vanny. Yeah, absolutely. I don't even have a I don't even have a second point to that. Greg Manning's coach of the year because I mean he is a record breaking MLS coach. He's the greatest MLS coach in a regular season history. Uh, the only other person that I think I'd like to point to and give some much needed credit is Veljko Paunovic. He took Chicago mm -hmm. Fire, which was a historically very poor team, and with the help of a very, very competent front office, built something that is worthy of respect. And that was not always uh, something that Chicago Fire fans thought could even happen. I remember when Ponovich joined Chicago, there wasn't a lot of hope for him either. So the fact that he's done so well, I think he deserves a nod as well. Yeah, I like him a lot. Yeah. Uh, I had him on uh, the night that they came down with that big trade for Dax McCarty. Yeah. I, I actually stay in contact with him. He's, he's a wonderful guy, bright mind, and, and I see him doing some real special things. And as a matter of fact, you mentioned Chicago. I just saw that Bastin Schweinsteiger will be on the bench. This is a shocker uh, to start the game, Armin. I don't know if he's hurt or his body, they're saying, is really run down. To me, this is a surprise. Yeah, they're starting one of their academy graduates. I'm not sure what his wow. name is exactly. I think Mihailovic is his name or something like that. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's a very interesting uh, selection, potentially a forced one. I'm not 100% like certain what the... What do you mean by forced? Maybe it is an injury, for example, like maybe Schweinsteiger can't yeah. play, can't put in a full 90 minutes. But uh, I'm not really sure. We'll have to see what happens with that one. Yeah, absolutely. So, Armin, before we let you go, my final, I tweeted out today, uh, the commissioner's worst nightmare. Even though I like sporting Kansas City, I'm going to say TFC and the Whitecaps. You? Yeah, that was who I had in my uh, in my bracket. But just to make it a little bit more interesting, I'll have TFC and Seattle again, just because I, oh. I would love to see a little bit of revenge. Wouldn't that be something? Now listen, this time around, I need you in the press box, staying warm, not out there freezing. I, I remember last year, Armin, we were in that press box and uh, MLS provided us with foot warmers, hand warmers, blankets, everything. There was heaters in there too, but it was so cold because it was uh, late at night and it was an unbelievable uh, frigid night and it just, uh, it was unbelievable, Armin. Yeah, that was some experience and one that I really, I, I'd like to change everything about that night, including uh, the outcome. Now, you know what? Only the outcome I'd like to change. The rest of it, it was surreal to yeah. sit there. You know what? That's fair. That's fair. You know, because let's be honest, Armin, we don't know. Let's hope we do get a final here this year again, but we don't know the next time we're going to see one. And the way the city embraced it, the way that they handled things, the way that the fans were incredible, respectful. If you noticed at the end, very quickly, I'll let you go, man. If you noticed at the end, a lot of supporters actually stayed behind uh, to, to watch the ceremony and actually give a hand as, to the Sounders and their team. No disrespect, no garbage, and that's what I love about our city. Yeah, we have a great city. We have a great group of supporters, probably among the best in MLS, if not the best in MLS. And you know what? Toronto deserves something, and I really hope that this is the year for it. I mean, it would be such a... 
sort of flat note to end on if it if it doesn't end with an MLS Cup after every like Toronto won everything this year. Supporters Shield, record breakers, Canadian Championship, Trillium Cup, four oh one Derby, like there was most wins, most uh, goals scored. Like it needs an MLS Cup to make it perfect and I guess we'll have to see. Absolutely. Oh, Armin, no. thank you so much again for making time out of your busy schedule. Keep up the great work at the score. And I don't know if some of the people got a chance at the beginning of the season. You were doing a great series where you talked to a lot of the clubs in MLS, if not all of them, if I'm not mistaken. And you talked to some of their players and you broke down the pluses and minuses and how things would end up. And, and I really enjoyed that. So hopefully we'll get some more great work from the playoffs from you. And obviously in the offseason, we're hearing about Kyle Lahren. I'll have some more information on that hopefully in the next few days. But great work and keep it up as well, Armin. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Anthony. And thanks for having me on. Pleasure is all mine. That's Armin Bedekin of The Score. Taking a quick commercial break on the Mac from The Athletic. Joshua Cloak joining us right here on Red Card. Stay tuned. The last thing I remember was my mother saying to me, Jack, Jack Omino, to avoid your bene bedroom, man, sangu mio. I gave her a kiss, and that was the last time I ever saw my mother. Now I'll tell you a story. Nobody with our people. You want a doctor, Jack? Yeah, I sell speed. I sell adrenaline. Hey. I got enough trombone players in my band. How are you, Jack? Everything all right? I love to shoot. First, what you do is you pull your intestines out of your ass, and you tie them in a Windsor knot around your neck, and then you dump the Jack. Yeah. You're a good man. Make no mistake about it. I'm not a good man. But if you're my friend, and you're my brother, and you're loyal to me, you're going to tell me first. I'll put my Beretta to my own head and blow my brains out. It's good. It's not over until you say it's over. Now I've got some things to talk to you about. Just cash your chips in now while you're still winning. Do you understand me, Jimmy? One day, you're going to learn to respect me. And some rats, you got to kill. You're not just one of us. You're family. I know these guys. You don't. This is not over. Nothing's going to happen to you. As long as I'm around. I gave her a kiss and that was the last time I ever saw my mother. And welcome back to Red Card. I'm your host, Anthony Toterra. Thanks again to Armin Badekian of The Score. We teed up. The MLS playoffs and TFC in specific will continue on right now with another young guy on the rise. Too many young guys in this business taking it over in a good, positive way from the athletic Joshua Cloak. Joshua, welcome. How are you, Anthony? Well, I'm not as good as you because I'm probably double your age. So to be young, to be in this city, to cover the team that's on fire, getting ready to make another long run, it's got to feel great, Joshua. Well, you're only as young as you feel, right? <laughs> Joshua, let's get right to it. Uh, let's discuss the Eastern Conference, and let's talk about the possible opponent the TFC will face. I discussed it with Armin. I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. To me, I, I don't know why everyone's so afraid to get Atlanta uh, in into the dance right away. I say get them in the dance, get it over with, because if this is a team that's loaded, stocked, and ready for any challenge, then take out the giant that everyone is fearing right off the start, because I tell you what, I'm more afraid of the New York Red Bulls. The last game here at home, I don't know if you were there at the game. I think you were. They played them toe-to-toe -to -toe physical. Uh, they could score with them, and they were missing some of their regulars, Joshua. Your thoughts? Yeah, I think, I, I think this is going to be a much more difficult run to the finals than it, than it was last year, and that's really saying something after the, that kind of epic uh, Montreal final from last year. I think the thing that you want to avoid and I think the reason you want to avoid Atlanta right now is, and I kind of wrote about this today, you know, Greg Vanny did a bit of lineup formation tinkering 
um, as as he went into that game, and he played a flat four in the back, and it didn't kind of come off. It, it wasn't executed as well as I think he hoped. So I think you want to allow some time if you're TFC to kind of draw up a, a better game plan because I think not necessarily on paper, but Atlanta seem like they're the type type of team that that can really offer the most pace and and really attack TFC. That and that's not a knock on the Red Bulls. I think. The Red Bulls are also going to pose a bit of a challenge, but I just think you know Greg needs some time to to better figure out um, how to attack Atlanta. So I, I, I think you know, given Chicago's poor form as of late, and um, I, I think it, I, I do think that New York's going to take this one, and and I think in that first round at least you, you're going to see hopefully Altidore come back to form, but. No, I think I'm inclined to, to, to disagree, and I, I just think that Atlanta is that good, or they've shown themselves to be that good, so you want to allow yourself some time to, to better figure them out, because, it, you know, Vanny has proven all season that he's a, a pretty master tactician, and he's, he is, he's aware of how important formations and how important the right lineup is on that day, so I think he still has to figure out uh, who is best 11 are for these games. And, and New York, they've played them you know, a few times, and they've had some success with them. So I think he'd be more inclined to say, we know we, we, we beat this team in September. We know what works. Let's go back to that now. And you know, they played Atlanta twice this year. They didn't beat them. You know, two, two, two draws. And that's tough because you don't have a formula that you can go back to and say, this worked for us. Let's go back to that, right? You know, Joshua, I wouldn't be one bit surprised if Atlanta runs the table and wins it all. That's how good they've been. Uh, that's how well coached they are. Uh, that has been a success story that I don't think can be repeated for a very, very long time. So to me, hey, look, the only reason why I'm saying is go at Atlanta right away is you slay the giant. Get them done and over with because if you believe you can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with anyone, then do it and move on. My concern is this. I don't have many concerns with this TFC squad they can score. You and I have seen it all season. Their midfield is unbelievable. The captain stirs the drink, I believe. I have two concerns. This will be the first playoff game that Alex Bono plays, number one. And number two, Joshua, I don't know about you. I said this about a month ago to a colleague in the press box. I says, I have a lot of concerns about that back four, that back that's playing in front of uh, Bono. I'm concerned that some of them aren't fast afoot. Uh, some of them positionally aren't in the position they need to be in certain uh, goals that they've given up. That's my concern. What's your concern? Well, I, I don't think you're. I don't think you're very far off on that back line. I think everybody could see that Drew Moore was just a, a step too uh, too slow, um, and and on uh, on Sunday. And it, that's not to say both goals were his, his fault, but both goals were a direct result of his actions and, and him not being right in there with the course of play. I mean, and, and I spoke to, to Drew on, on Tuesday. Um, for him to get his hands up with a, a cross in, in the air uh, like that, he knows that that's something that, that, that he probably shouldn't have done. And then, you know, he's just a step too short uh, defending Martinez on that cross in, and it doesn't really take much for Martinez to knock that ball in. So that's a concern. Um you know, Drew Moore's getting up there in age, and and he for everything that he brings to the locker room, and and you know, you watch him in training. He's a very vocal guy. He's the guy that he's a, a bit of a quarterback back there, and and you need that type of personality. But I think he needs to um, really do a lot of you know, spend some time studying some tape and better to better figure out who these attackers are and to better figure out their movements because it just seemed like Martinez was able to work his way past Drew Moore quite often. And, you know, as a center back, uh, especially if they're going to go back to that flat four, it, like he said, it's all about these individual matchups. So he has to be a step quicker. Um, the thing about the back line, the, the reason it worked, you know, with three in the back is is they really relied heavily on Chris Mavinga's athleticism. And he was able to just cover those attackers and catch up to attackers so quickly. And I think that really works for them. But in a more of a, in a, a flat four in the back, he's kind of 
restricted and, and he has to stay in line with the rest of, of that back line. So I don't think that works for them as well. So, yeah, a lot of issues, I would say, in the back that need to be addressed. And I, I don't think that's lost on Greg Vanny. I think, you know, he knows that, that man marking has been an issue for, for the back line at times. So he'll probably spend a lot of time over training looking at that. As far as Alex Bono goes, um, I don't doubt, and I haven't all season, I, I haven't doubted Alex's ability to make big saves. He's, a, he's very much a big-time guy who who likes to use his, his big frame to, to make that kind of show-stopping save. And he did, you know, late in the game in, against Atlanta. You saw that. What concerns me with Alex is his distribution of the ball after saves. Um, he misses his spots a lot. And that could be, you know, his wing backs not getting in, in place properly. But I think that's something he needs to work on. And, and, and all this comes down to is TFC generally needing to just settle down a bit. I felt they rushed the ball and they rushed the course of play uh, throughout Sunday. And, and they need to get back to that team that we saw in July that was just this one-two touch game was so fluid and they just made such quick work of opponents, and, and it's still there. You know, it's not like they've lost anyone, but you need to get back to that style of play very quickly because as the playoffs have gotten closer, I just find that TFC, have, the pressure of the playoffs has been mounting, and, and you can't help but wonder if, if that's starting to, to creep into the locker room at all because all season they've been talking about, all right, our goal here is MLS Cup, and, and you know, the regular season in a lot of ways is irrelevant. The playoffs are what matters, and now they're here, yeah, a lot of questions about how they can deal with it, right? And, and that's the last part I wanted to talk to you before we move on to the Western Conference and who you think is going to come out of there. It's the mental part uh, of uh, of these playoffs for this group. And I believe in that first game, this is the other concern I have, Joshua, and I'd like your thoughts on it, is if they go down a goal or two in that first leg, in let's just say it's the New York Red Bulls for argument's sake, I'm concerned that mentally... Uh, they're going to have a lot of pressure and stress coming home knowing they're going to have to put maybe three uh, on the board to get past the Red Bulls. And do they have that in them? Because the pressure will be on them knowing that everyone is watching, everyone is hoping and expecting them to get to the final. And then I'm afraid what's going to happen if they don't because, look, let's be honest. We heard the boos in Atlanta for Josie, for Michael. I thought it was stupid, but I liked it because it really gave an, an unbelievable atmosphere and it's done all over the world. But can you imagine the focus and pressure that will be on these guys if they don't progress ahead to the final, Joshua? It's rare. It, it, it's, it's very rare as a pro athlete who's playing on the biggest stage, some of the biggest stages in the world, that you get a second chance. And I really believe that, that Michael Bradley in particular has a second chance here. And, and I know that, that Michael probably wore, you know, that loss, uh, you know, in World Cup qualifying very, very hard. And, you know, he probably shouldered a lot of the blame and, and probably felt it personally and, and Josie as well. So here's a second chance for those two in particular to in in a sense, right the wrongs of World Cup qualifying and 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 what went down there and and so I think that that pressure is is a good thing because this you know Bradley in particular has had a pretty big chip on his shoulder all season and and that's a good thing so you like them coming home and and having that second leg at home and and you know you you want to have those type of players that have been in big game situations and know and have seen it go wrong. Because, I mean, you, you, there's there's something to be said for talent, but there's also something to be said for a player that has had those kind of big games. I don't want to say stolen away from them because, you know, that game wasn't stolen away from them. That, that game was there for the taking. And if you get that second chance, I'm a big believer that a, a player like Michael Bradley isn't going to let that He's just not going to let a team that he captains go down twice. Um, you know, they've they've talked all year about BMO Field being a fortress, and I, and I really believe it is. And, and you know, it, again, the message out of the locker room wasn't, you know, we won the supporter shield, and and that's great. Look at us. It was we won the supporter shield, and that ensures that the last game we play this season will be at home, and that's a big deal. 
if you have the the atmosphere and if you have the crowd support that you do at BMO Field. So the second chance is is there for you know Altador and Bradley, and and I just I, you know I don't see a situation where they're going to let you know that same kind of opportunity slip by him twice and the ace in the hole that we didn't talk about we don't have time we'll move on to the western that i said in the first part of the show that i think is going to be a huge difference is the gem of all gems this season victor vasquez i can't wait to watch this guy in a playoff game here in toronto i think if he's healthy watch out it's a direct express path to the final. Joshua, let's turn to the Western Conference very quickly before we let you go. I tweeted out earlier today, the worst nightmare for MLS commissioner will be uh, a Canadian all-final. So I'm predicting the Caps and TFC in the final. But I tell you what, Sporting Kansas City to me is a complete team. They finished the season on a poor note. But I believe Peter Vermees is the best coach in MLS. And they will have a lot. A lot of people on their toes and antsy and nervous because if they can get to a final, watch out. Your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, Sporting KC is a team that really prides themselves on their defenders. A really, really intense and really, uh, you know, dedicated, focused group of defenders. And you know, we saw last year in in MLS Cup. I mean, if you can keep a game close and you can win a game ugly, then you know, if you have the ability to do that, that can go a really, really long way. So they're going to lean very heavily on that back line as, as they should. I mean, if you... TFC have, have proven that they have the ability to win games in an ugly manner, um, and that's the kind of club that can really go toe-to-toe with them in a really ugly game. I, I don't know if fans at, at BMO want to see another ugly uh you know mls cup final but that's probably the kind of game that you would see if 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 tfc had to go up against the sporting kc because the back line is good it could cause some frustration can they press uh tfc's back line like a lot of other clubs could no um but you know if you stay in a game long enough you know it's mls weird things happen right Absolutely. Joshua, so give us your uh, pick out of the West. Give us your pick out of the East. Who's going to the final? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I would be silly to bet against uh, TFC going to the final right now. Um, something about Seattle uh, has, I don't want to say scared me, but, you know, that, that kind of experience, it's, it's, it's largely the same lineup as, as last season. So I could see them going back um and it, it it wouldn't make you know that's not the kind of variety or parody that the mls prides itself upon but yeah i could see another uh, toronto seattle final nice i would love that it, it would be unbelievable and those fans from seattle uh, they'll travel here once again they'll enjoy the great city of toronto of ours give us your mvp of 2017 victor vasquez and and that's no for me, it's, it's absolutely no question. I, I, anybody who was at uh, Footy Talks the other week knows how I feel about him. I think Victor Vasquez is, on a team like TFC, littered with stars, but you just look at the jump in performance from a, a fairly competitive TFC team last year to an outright dominant team this year. He's the best passer in MLS. He's the most creative player in MLS, um, and he is the one that has transformed TFC from a good team to a team that, you know, is on the verge of, of being called the best in history. Now, is that for club or for the league? Because I want it for the league. Uh, yeah, I, I'd be inclined to say he'd be close, but I think Diego Valeri is, is doing things at Portland um, so much so that if, if he's not there, I don't think Portland is even in the conversation, right? Yeah, that's my pick as well. Valeria is my pick. And you know what? I wouldn't have no problems whatsoever with Victor Vasquez. I tell you, he was a treat to watch each and every time I was down there in the press box, Joshua. The vision, the creativity, the elegance. He's the full package. I mean, uh, my sons come to the games as often as they come. Uh, and they love watching Jovinko and Bradley and Josie. But lately they've been saying, Dad, you know what? Is Vasquez, just the way he sprays the ball around the field, the awareness, 
is 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 unbelievable. It's it's just beautiful to watch, and I couldn't agree. Lastly, coach of the year in MLS. Yeah, and and I understand that I'm beginning to sound like a bit of a homer here. <laughs> you know, I, and I, I think that, and and again, perhaps a bit biased uh, considering how much time I've spent around Greg Vanny, but he has turned that three five two into from an experiment into the kind of formation that um, other teams are now kind of mimicking. And, and, and he's turned a, a very, he's harnessed a lineup full of, let's be honest, egos. And he's, you know, a great man manager. And look, if, if you're being judged on the regular season, which he is, he set the record, his team set the record for MLS points in a season. And, that's not something that anybody will, will ever be able to take well until the next team. That's not something that anybody can take away from them. Um, and so if you're being judged on that, it's, it's really hard to argue against it because, yes, you could say, well, if anybody had that kind of talent, you could probably get results. But to keep them focused all year long where 4 nil wins just become commonplace, um, and to have the, the kind of you know the, the kind of stars that he has on that team, and I've seen it firsthand. I've, I've literally seen him rein in stars in training, and and that's not an easy thing to do. Um, so for me, yeah, Greg Vanny is a an obvious pick. And I again, I, I know how much of a homer that's making me sound, but it's listen, it's a fun time to to it's a fun time to be around. You know TFC because uh, obviously, as as you know, there was some pretty lean years previously. Yeah, and we'll talk about that just before we let you go. We'll give you a minute or so to talk about a special project, but I'll finish up by saying that was my pick as well with Armin Bedekian of the score is uh, head coach Greg Vanny as coach of the year. I've known Greg now since the first day he arrived here, and he was coaching the youngsters on the academy League One Ontario team. And from the first day we met, from the first day we had conversations, coffee phone discussions, on and on and on. Uh, I, I really enjoyed uh, picking his brain, discussing the game, but even away from the field, he's a class act, Joshua. I don't think a lot of people understand what a caring and, and, and wonderful person he is. And he, he's a guy that I believe a lot of the guys in that dress room uh, want to help uh, achieve this success. Where a lot of people wanted him out. Let's not forget, not too long ago, a lot of people wanted him out. And I kept on saying, Give him some time, and he's got the time, and look what he's done. Hey, listen, Joshua, let's talk about a special project that you're working on just before we let you go. I understand it's a book. Tell us a little bit about that, and when will it be coming out? Yeah, I was very, very, very fortunate to be approached by uh, Dundurn Press, uh, you know, very established uh, book publisher that's based in Toronto, and and they came to me uh, wanting to know if I'd be interested in, in doing a book on Toronto FC. So my vision for the book, it's tentatively titled, Come On, You Read the Story of TFC. And, and the idea for the book is, is basically how did TFC carve out a niche in the most crowded sports market um, in North America? And when you look around MLS, you see a lot of clubs that are just getting by. But with TFC at least off the pitch, it clicked very early on. So this book is going to tell the story of not just the club, but how did this club create such an incredible fan culture and how did this, how did these fans stick by? And obviously on the pitch, what were the things that the TFC did to become, you know, to go from a laughing stock to, you know, the very model of success in MLS. Um, if you look at TFC, you know, we saw what happened last year in the playoffs, and I think you're going to see something, hopefully, very similar in Toronto. They they very much captivated the city, and I'm a big believer that there is no other city in North America that is so singularly focused on one team, and, and I'm talking about the Leafs there. There are big teams across North America, but if you look at those big clubs, you know, the Boston Red Sox, they also have a you know, a New England Patriots right up there with them, you know, and, and even at big clubs like the Los Angeles Lakers, where you could say, well, the Dodgers might be just as big. The Leafs are so, so, so popular in the city. But last year, you saw TFC for a brief time become the biggest club in the city. And for an MLS team to do that outside of a Seattle where there's not a lot of teams, 
of Portland where there's only one other team. Like, that's almost impossible to do. How did it happen with TFC? So my book will tell the story of the club, and, and it, again, it will tell the story of the fans that basically helped get this club to something special in a in a city where, you know what, it, it might not have worked. So it'll be out... Uh, October 2018, we're we're hoping, and uh, look, I'm I'm excited to just talk to any and all people that have been around TFC, and and that's the, the great thing too is I kind of put out some feelers on Twitter, and and the response I've gotten from fans, and the kind of the personal stories that I've gotten, and this is a club that's only been around for 11 years. Absolutely, I, I I'm looking forward to it, and uh, you know, there's not too many people myself and only a couple others that can say we've been there since day one that's why i said at the beginning of the show joshua i'm almost double your age so i was there right at the beginning and i'll tell you a very very quick story because time is our worst enemy that first first year uh i think it was the first or second year that i was there i was coaching my my first son i believe and i and i remember getting an opportunity to bring andrew boyens andy boyens the new zealander uh that played with tfc on the back end a defender and the goalie coach at that time with TFC was Carmen Asako. He's now with York University in Vaughan. And I remember him coming out to my son's practice in this gymnasium. And these kids thought, this was the world. We got a TFC player. And here's this New Zealander thinking, do these kids even know me? I'm a guy, you know, that's a nobody. I come off the bench and I start a couple games here and there. Then lo and behold, years later, some of those players have played with my son. Uh, Joshua came up to me after watching that World Cup disastrous game against Italy when New Zealand uh, played them and drew them. They remembered Andrew Boynes was starting and he shone. And players had their balls signed by him in the gym there and it goes down as a memory. Many memories I have, but that was just one that just hit me right now as I was talking to you. Yeah, and again, you you you, um, you forget almost in a way, not forget, but but people have yet to realize the impact that TFC has had on, on local soccer culture here, um, and, and we're going to see that, uh, you know, perhaps 5, 10, 20 year, years down the road, you're going to say, you're going to see kids that said, I, I got into the game and I, I started to take this game seriously, you know, because of Seba or because of Michael. And, and, and that's an important part of the story as well, because you and I both know we have a, a wealth of soccer interest in this city that just needs to be harnessed. And, you know, if TFC is, is going to be the catalyst for, for kids kind of taking the game a little more seriously and investing more time in the game and not treating it just as a recreational thing to do in the you know, in the summer, I think that's that's a win-win, not just for soccer in Canada, but or sorry, not just for soccer in Toronto, but soccer in Canada. Right? Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. You got to promise me once you get those books printed and out, they're for sale. You're going to give us one for the show here, so we can give it out as a prize. We'll do some trivia because I'd love to give one out on the show. Absolutely, at my word. Outstanding, Joshua. Good luck on the book. Hope to see you in the press box in that first playoff game. And again, thank you so much for joining us. Keep up the great work at The Athletic, my friend. Thanks for having me on. That is Joshua Cloak of The Athletic, and that's exciting. He's getting a book ready uh, to get out there uh, with TFC from the first day all the way up until now. That's great because uh, there's a lot of stories that need to be told, a lot of memories, a lot of players that I'm sure he'll mention in there, and it'll be a lot of great reading for a lot of people out there. So I'm looking forward to that. And as he said, he'll give us a book here, and we'll put out a trivia question and we'll give it out to a winner. We're going to take a quick commercial break, then we'll wrap it up all nicely with some grassroots thoughts I have right here as we close out the show. Stay tuned right here on Red Card. I've been sitting here. 